Hello, and welcome to the Career Compass program, which includes online learning sessions, podcasts, videos, webinars, white papers, and whiteboard videos, all specifically designed for NAVFAC. Please check the Career Compass Resource Center or CCRC often for updates and new content to support your learning. This content will assist with learning and development within the 20 non technical competencies outlined in the Workforce Development Strategy. The topic for today's webinar is dealing with ambiguity in support of the decisiveness competency. Throughout this video, you will see a paper pencil icon on some slides indicating a workbook activity. When you see this icon in the top left corner, this means I'll be asking you to write something in your workbook or refer to your workbook. If possible, Download the workbook from the Career Compass Resource Center or CCRC before continuing with this course. However, if you are not able to, no worries. Just use any piece of paper and write your thoughts down on that. You can always transfer that to the workbook later. Today you will learn how to manage ambiguous situations when making decisions. So you know what to expect today, here is a summary of our agenda today. First, we'll categorize types of decisions and how to gather data to make decisions. Then, we'll factor ambiguity into decision-making and close with tips you can use right away. In order to talk more about decisiveness, let's first define decisiveness. Decisiveness is the ability to make decisions quickly and confidently, by a person or a team. Being decisive is about having the power or quality of deciding. What are the benefits of being decisive? I'd like you to pause the video and think about that for a moment. Record your thoughts on page 4 of your workbook. Resume the video when you are ready. Why is decisiveness important? There are many reasons. First, decisiveness reduces ambiguity. When a decision is made, the individual and team know what to do. Next, decisiveness helps us deal with change more effectively because we know what to expect based on the decision. In addition, decisiveness also improves the speed of the decisions we make, preventing bottlenecks. When all this happens, Less time is spent, so we help our NAVFAC projects stay within scope. Now that we know what decisiveness is and why it is important, how can we categorize various types of decisions? Let's look at four types of decisions using two axes, scope and impact, and level of familiarity. Scope can be narrow or broad. Level of familiarity is unfamiliar and infrequent, or familiar and frequent. Using that matrix, the four types of decisions are ad hoc, big bet, cross cutting, and delegated. Let's first talk about ad hoc decisions. These decisions are infrequent and low stakes. They have a narrow scope and impact. Their impact on the organization depends upon how concentrated they are. Here are a few points we all need to remember while making ad hoc decisions. First, it's easy to dismiss this type of decision because it's low stakes. Keep your focus and avoid negatively dismissing it as unimportant. Also, Keep communicating with your team and your colleagues through the decision-making process so they know what to expect, even if it is low stakes. Next, let's talk about the big bet decisions. These decisions are again infrequent, but with high risk. They have a potential to shape the future of the organization. These often involve situations where the right or the wrong choices are ambiguous. 
A few things to keep in mind while making big bet decisions are Because these decisions are high risk, break the decision into pieces to gain some clarity. Then rejoin the pieces together to observe any variances, which may help you make a decision. In addition, establish a standard decision making process while making these decisions. Then you can go back and see how the decision was made if you need to pivot. The third type of decisions are cross-cutting decisions. These small and interconnected decisions are more frequent and familiar, and have a broad scope and impact on the organization. Here are a few points to remember while making cross-cutting decisions. Before making the cross-cutting decisions, the first step is to map out the entire decision-making process. This will involve running the water through the pipes to test for any discrepancies. By running the water through the pipes numerous times, you can find the weaknesses in your process and work those out. Within the organization, decision-making bodies should be formed to build on the shared objectives, metrics, as well as the partnership targets. The fourth type of decisions are delegated decisions. Though their scope is much smaller as compared to the big bet decisions, these are more recurring and are a part of the daily routine. These carry low risk and are handled by an individual or working team with limited input from others. Here are a few points to remember while making delegated decisions. Delegate the entire decision making and let the assignee formulate a process rather than following your set guidelines. Also, the decision authority should be clearly communicated. Just to summarize what we have covered so far, the four types of decisions are ad hoc decisions, which are infrequent and low impact, big bet decisions, which are infrequent and high impact, cross-cutting decisions, which are frequent and high impact, and Delegated decisions, which are frequent and low impact. Now let's use the information in an example. Raman is used to making delegated decisions, which are frequent and low impact. Now he's been asked to make a big bet decision, which is infrequent and high impact. He's never done this before, so he asks for your help. What are some things he could do to break down the decision-making process? For example, he could form a subcommittee. What else could he do? Please pause the video and think about some things Raman could do to help with this decision-making process. Record your thoughts on page 7 of the workbook. Resume the video when you are ready. Some things which Raman could do to break down the decision-making process could be have his team make decisions and inform him before implementing the decisions. He could set up brainstorming sessions with his colleagues. He could arrive on a decision via voting in his group. Or he could use consensus-based decision-making. So now that we know the four types of decisions, what data do we need to make a decision? We'll discuss three types of data that helps make decisions. Salient, contextual, and patterned. Let's talk about salient data. Salient data grabs your attention due to its startling nature. For example, Let's say the revenue of travel and tourism industry in 2020 is $396.4 billion, a fall of 42% compared to 2019. That's startling, right? But does it mean that tourism is going to be wiped out? Or are we just not counting the effect of the pandemic on the travel and tourism industry? We don't know what it means, which can cloud our decision making. Next, we have contextual data. Contextual data presents you with the information which provides context to an event, person, 
or an item, while its context to another event may not be visible. This may lead to a wrong perception. For example, let's say that gluten-free food is healthy. That may be true. Yet gluten-free merely means there is no wheat in the food. The food could still contain unhealthy ingredients like fat and sugar. This incomplete data may lead to incomplete information and wrong decisions. Finally, patterned data generates information which is based on repeated sequences of events. At first glance, the data seems to have a repeated pattern. For example, getting a succession of heads or tails while flipping a coin may create a pattern, yet it does not establish a guaranteed pattern for the next set of coin flips. All these types of data may lead to bias in decision-making. Bias is a tendency to believe some ideas are better than others. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we are aware of it. However, if we're not aware, our bias can influence our decisions. I'd like you to pause the video and think about the following question. Where have you seen bias in decision-making? Please pause the video and resume when you are ready. During a live session of this course, some of the participants responded that they have observed the following types of bias in decision-making. Location bias, friendship bias, and gender and age bias. Using the same examples as earlier, we can see some of the bias that may impact decision-making. The salient data, which is startling, could create a bias where the most shocking statistics get the most attention, eclipsing the more relevant data. With contextual bias, we may take the data as a rule without understanding the bigger picture. Finally, patterned bias leads us to assume patterns exist that don't. All of this hinders our ability to make effective decisions. Here's a scenario I'd like you to evaluate. Identify the type of bias involved here. A player rolls four sixes in a row during a dice game and believes the next roll will also be a six. What kind of bias is reflected here? Is it salient bias, contextual bias, or patterned bias? Let me repeat that. A player rolls four sixes in a row during a dice game and believes the next roll will be a six. What kind of bias is reflected here? Is it salient bias, contextual bias, or patterned bias? I'll pause for a few seconds here so you can think about that. The right answer is patterned bias. Even though sixes were rolled each time previously, those results were completely random. There is actually no way one can predict if this pattern will be repeated. Now that we know about the four types of decisions and the biased data inserts into our decisions, how do we make decisions in ambiguous or uncertain situations? Uncertainty simply means the state of being uncertain or having some doubt or hesitancy. Let's discuss the four levels of uncertainty. Level 1 is clear outcome. Level 2 is alternative outcome. Level 3 is range of outcomes. And level 4 is uncertain outcomes. At level 1, clear outcome Organizations are able to simply predict a single future outcome on the basis of what they can define. These projections point towards a unique strategic path and the level of uncertainty is negligible. Information is readily available and able to be used for making future business decisions. Level 2 is about the alternative outcome. 
organizations can describe the future based on a few alternative outcomes. Though the exact outcome cannot be determined, the probability of each of the alternatives to happen can be easily estimated. All the possible outcomes are visible, but still, what will happen in the future cannot be predicted. Level 3 of uncertainty involves situations where a range of outcomes are possible. This range of possibilities can be predicted, but the actual outcome may lie anywhere within that range. This range, though, is dependent on a few important factors, which can be studied and used to make future decisions. Knowing these factors would certainly help, but the possible outcomes are still not 100% clear. The level of uncertainty here is much higher than in levels 1 and 2. The final and highest level of uncertainty is called uncertain outcomes. Multiple levels of uncertainty combine at this level and create scenarios which are almost impossible to anticipate. It is difficult to predict a range of potential outcomes. Though these situations are rare, they do exist. Now that we understand about decision-making and uncertainties involved in decision-making, how do we make decisions in ambiguous times? Here are some tips. Asking effective questions will support the decision-making process. Keep your questions open, short, forward-focused. Asking open-ended questions requires elaboration and sharing of information. Avoid questions starting with will, did, have, and why. Instead, start asking your questions with what, who, and how. A few examples of such questions are, instead of asking, will the project be done on time? Ask, what might stand in the way of meeting the deadline? Instead of asking, did you check all of the requirements? Ask, which of the requirements concerns you the most? Instead of asking, have you notified Sarah about the changes? Ask, how will you go about bringing everyone up to speed about the changes? Another tip for making decisions to take action is to keep your questions short. Use questions that are eight words or less. This allows you to listen more and gather verbal data while the other person talks. Some examples include, what does success look like? What's the impact of that on the team? And, where haven't you looked for a solution? Lastly, keep your questions forward-focused. This will help you think about the future instead of the past. Some examples are, how do you want it to go in the future? And, where do you want to be in six months? We've covered a lot today, including types of decisions, bias in decisions, and tips to ask questions to gather the info you need for decisions. As we wrap up, in your workbook on page 11, please write down your thoughts on this reflection. What did you take from this learning session that you can apply to your current position today? And what is the most important tip you will share with a coworker that wasn't able to participate today? Feel free to pause the video and record your thoughts now or take some time after this course to reflect on these questions. Thank you for completing this course today. Please email the Total Force Development account listed on your screen and in the workbook with any questions or comments, or contact your local civilian training advocate or BD-17. You will receive credit for participating in this course. To receive credit, email the address below with the listed subject line, course name, and completion code. Please check the Career Compass Resource Center or CCRC often for updates and new content to support your learning. Again, thank you for your participation.